I've recently been looking at this old image from 2003 and wondering if uh, I can't do a better job of processing and printing it. It just looks a bit overcooked, overprocessed to me. In its day it was quite successful. It won a few awards, did quite well for me and I still really like it but I think I can do better. I don't know if other photographers get this but occasionally I have these breakthrough images that change the way I think about photography and take photographs and future images and this image was certainly one of those. There are a couple of things about it which were quite significant for me. One was that the lighting in the image is actually quite flat. The final image looks nothing like what the lighting was in the scene at the time. It was sort of a soft overcast sunset light but I knew that in post-processing I could make it look quite good. So that was one thing. The other thing was when I stood in the position I wanted to get the composition I wanted to get everything to line up I knew I'd never get it in with the widest lens I had with me at the time which was a 24 millimeter. I knew the only way I could fit it in from where I was standing would be to use the widest possible lens on a vertical orientation and then move the camera around and take multiple exposures so I would get a, a stitched image probably six or seven shots to get the whole scene I wanted in. What that led to though was a more spectacular view than I had imagined because it really pushes that subject, the tree, right into the foreground and everything else pushes into the background. Much wider perspective than you could get with just a single shot on 24mm lens. So here I am in Photoshop with the original layered file open. I can see that I have 12 layers on top of the stitched panorama. So even back in 2003 I had a layered approach to processing and I think it's still a good way to think about working an image. So firstly it's non-destructive, meaning you can always revert back to the untouched bottom layer. And secondly you can build up a finished image by isolating one problem at a time. I can hide all layers except the bottom layer by option clicking the bottom layer icon. By the way I'm working on a Mac so if you're following along on a PC whenever you hear me say option key just replace it with the alt key. You can see the image is quite flat which is closer to how it looked to the naked eye. So the next layer up called wire patch just addresses a stitching error. Then we have patch layer which just addresses missing area top right and another stitching area on the trunk. Next are a series of adjustment layers that just build up the tone of the image one layer at a time. If I open up this curve layer that adjusts the sky and sea area you can see it's quite a complex curve that also has quite a complex mask attached to it. And some of these layers just address oversaturation which is a known flaw in Photoshop when you're using adjustment layers to try and only address color and luminosity uh, it tends to oversaturate. I tend to work kind of organically in this layer based approach to color correction addressing the biggest problems first and then just fine tuning as I get higher in the layer stack. My challenge today is to see if I can do this entire image from stitching together the panorama to all of the masking and color correction entirely in Lightroom. So apart from saving me hours of Photoshop work, I'm also hoping to produce a more compelling image. So here's the original six images. To stitch them together in Lightroom, I just select all and use the keyboard shortcut Control M to take me to the panorama window. Or you can just left click on one of the images and go down to Photo Merge Panorama. I make sure Cylindrical is selected, which is correct for a single row panorama. Then I check to see which of Fill Edges or Boundary Warp does the best job of filling in the holes left around the edge of the panorama. I prefer Fill Edges as in this case it produces a pretty good fill. If it didn't I would have applied Boundary Warp but I'd rather not stretch parts of the image if I can avoid it. Now that I have the merged panorama I can get to work on tonal adjustments. I like to start with global corrections before I target particular areas. The white balance is fine so I'm going to start with the exposure to lighten up the image a bit overall. I'm just trying to get the tree looking good at this stage. 
I follow that up by dragging the black slider to the left to introduce some contrast into the darkest shadows. I'll click the shadow clipping slider on the histogram to make sure I don't clip information in the shadows. A little bit of clipping is fine. I can see that if I adjust for the trunk I'm clipping too much of the foliage and I'll address that later with an adjustment layer. Next I drag the contrast slider to the right. Now the trunk is looking better but I see I'm getting a bit of highlight clipping. I will also address this later with an adjustment layer. At this stage I like to do a before and after by pressing the Y key to see the original image next to the adjusted image. So far so good. And now for the targeted masking layers. First I want to address the sky and sea, both of which are far too light. If I click on the sky icon, Lightroom does its clever magic stuff and produces a pretty good job of selecting the sky only. By default it shows a red mask which is pretty handy for viewing the area that's being masked. I can add to this mask by clicking the add button on this mask and in this case I want to go down to brush because I'm going to have to do a, a bit of precision mark, masking to add in the sea area to the sky. Because there's a reasonably clear edge between the background and the foreground, I'm going to click the checkbox auto mask to see if it helps me isolate the background and it, it probably will. If you find you do go over an edge, hold down the option key and your brush changes to an eraser. Your scroll wheel can also adjust the brush size and if you hold down the shift key while scrolling you can adjust the brush softness. Another handy thing to know is you can adjust the zoom level on the left hand panel set. The navigator panel at the top has a drop down menu that lets you adjust the zoom all the way up to 1600% if you really want to see the actual pixels. But I find 200% is ample for precision masking. After about 5 minutes work I'm pretty happy with the mask. I'm going to start with the exposure slider as the overall brightness was my main problem. I immediately see an issue with the brush mask I've added to address the C area. It's just way too dark. To address this I can drag the brush mask out of the sky group so that it's in its own separate mask. I will also name the masks here just to make things a bit easier to follow. Now that the mask is separated I can drag its exposure slider to the right to reintroduce some brightness. I also need to do a bit of work on the edge that overlaps the sea. Alright I'm happy with that. Back to the sky layer I'm going to play with the sliders a bit to see how far I can go before things look overcooked. So a bit of contrast seems to help. I'm going to try the clarity slider as I know it's pretty popular for making skies really dramatic and pop out. But I want the sky to be just a supporting actor in this drama so I'm going to stay away from the clarity slider for now. I think it's looking a bit dark at the bottom of the sky so I can adjust this by subtracting a gradient mask from the sky mask. I click the subtraction button on the sky mask and select gradient mask. By dragging from the bottom I can gradually feather the mask for a subtle effect. Drag the top or the bottom to control the size of the gradient and drag the middle to experiment with the positioning of the gradient. You can see the effect of this gradient by clicking the eye icon next to the gradient on and off. And now that the sky selection is more subtle I can add a subtle amount of blue to the color temperature of the sky. I think this just helps give it a little bit more separation and make it feel a bit more distance from the tree. Now to address the clipped shadow in the foliage. I'll turn the black clipping warning on and I'm just going to roughly select the area with a radial gradient. By simply moving the black slider to the right I can get rid of that clipping which may have reduced the quality of any large prints that I want to do. One last local adjustment I want to make is to make the central trunk area stand out a bit to draw the viewer's eye into this area without being too obvious of course. I'll just use a simple radial gradient for this. I'm just tweaking the exposure and contrast in this case and I'll add in a little bit of clarity but not too much. I can do a before and after by clicking the mask icon on and off and I see that it's affecting the sky highlights a bit more than I'd like. I could just use the highlight slider but I see this also affects the trunk a bit so instead I'm going to subtract the sky from this mask. I click the subtract button and go down to sky and then the sky is taken out of the masking. Now that I have the image unified I usually like to go back to global adjustments and see if any final tweaking is warranted. 
I'll just check the overall brightness with the exposure slider and I'm also a bit of a sucker for the post crop vignetting effect down in the bottom panel of the right hand panel group but not too much I don't want to want the viewers to actually notice it and because this was taken with a cheap 24 to 85 millimeter lens I will check the sharpening but once again I don't want to be too aggressive the sharpening in the develop module is only meant to correct for optical softening the sharpening for output is done only when you export the file but that's another whole video and now to compare before and after using the Y key I'm pretty happy with that so now to compare it to my original Photoshop result from all those years ago so here are my three processed images in the order they were done in my first attempt you can see the potential but it's a bit clumsy with the masking the second attempt is cleaner but it's still a bit heavy-handed and the masking is a bit obvious in places I definitely like my latest attempt the masking is much cleaner it doesn't feel as heavy and dark to my eye and it's just more believable an added bonus is that it took a fraction of the time to do in Lightroom as opposed to my original Lightroom and Photoshop layer based workflow I'm a bit old school and I started photography in the film days and I've always liked the Ansel Adams quote the negative is the score and the print is the performance of course these days it would translate as the digital file is the score and the process or the print is the performance there's no one right interpretation of a digital capture and that's the beauty of it really it's up to you how you conduct your performance if that's not stretching the metaphor too far so I'm here at Hagley Park because I just want to demonstrate the impact of using a wide angle lens like a 24 I have on this full frame Sony camera in the vertical format I want to emphasize the power of using that for a panorama when you're really close to a subject like this impressive tree in front of us so I've got this panorama head which allows me to rotate the camera around the optical center of the lens and normally I don't worry about this in a landscape shot when you're a long way from the subject because the parallax error that you get which I'm going to demonstrate in a minute doesn't really occur but when you're close to a subject like this you can get stitching errors when you don't rotate the camera around the optical center of the lens so the panorama head I'm using is really right stuff I only really use it if I'm doing panoramas close to a subject or architectural work um, or multi-row panoramas it's quite a sophisticated device but it's quite heavy to carry around so it has a leveling base so by adjusting the leveling base I can get the rotating axis perfectly level without having to even up the tripod legs and then it also has calibration markings for different lenses so that they do rotate around the optical center and then I can also move the camera up and down like this if I want to do a multi-row stitch for a really high resolution image so it's a very precise device but quite slow to work with and heavy to carry around so I don't generally carry it into the back country I'm going to show you what it's like when you rotate the camera around the optical center and then I'm going to try and shift the camera off the center and show you what happens so I'm set up to do a wide angle stitch close to a subject with the camera in vertical format which is going to give me quite an impressive really wide angle panoramic look and using a self timer so I'm not bumping the camera when it's doing the exposures I'm on f8 for good depth of field ISO 100 for maximum quality and 
Not really worried about the shutter speed, but it's about 125. So here is the resulting panorama taken with the 24mm lens vertical orientation. And here is the same tree shot as a stitched panorama with an 85mm lens, just for comparison. It gives quite a different look. So there you have it. Stitching with wide angle lenses close to a subject is a great way to get really dynamic, high resolution landscape images that look a bit different. Thanks for watching.